So y'all are enjoying this heat, huh? <laughs> oh, boy. Well, listen, uh, what's that now? Oh, shoot. Well, you then on my big fat belly hangs out and everything, you know. <laughs> well, anyway, let us, um, uh, I'd like to ask a homer, would you open us a word of prayer, please, this morning, brother? Amen. Ruth really touched on a lot of what we're going to be looking at this morning. If you'd like to open your Bibles to chapter 8 of John, John chapter 8, as we continue uh, in this study, we may get through it, uh, through it this morning. But as we do, um, we are under attack, aren't we? Every moment, every second of every day, and uh, we can forget that often. And we need to understand that we have this promise from the Lord that we are His children, and as His children, we're overcomers. But we are only overcomers when we really put our full weight upon the Lord and also have the right perspective as we consider the Lord as we consider that we can truly throw our burden upon him and trust him in every aspect of every situation that we're in and understand he never puts more on us than we're able to bear. Now, that's hard to do sometimes, but we may see some of that in our study this morning as well. In John, chap I mean, in, uh, yeah, John chapter 8, as we begin this study, we have looked at it for several weeks now, we begin with and just want to remember that Jesus said, uh, as we look at uh, John chapter 8 and verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Wow. My friends, we live in, in light as a child of God. If you're here as a child of God this morning, he went on to say that he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now, these are the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're absolute, aren't they? They are true. They're always true. So if you're as a child of God, you can walk in this wonderful light. It doesn't mean that all of your problems are solved. It doesn't mean you're not going to face tremendous challenges in the world, does it? For they're all there. But what the Lord has promised you is here, you can have the true light. You can have through Him, you can, you, you can walk in peace, you can walk in joy, and you can walk in truth and wisdom. And you can have the comfort that can only come through him of knowing that everything is truly all right. And that's so important in these days. As we've looked in our studies so too, too, we've seen how, how, uh, how Jesus uh, pointed out how, and emphasized the bondage that they were in to this crowd that he was at. Remember, this is the day after, after the Feast of the Tabernacles, and he's been, they've been tried to trip him up in so many different ways. But he brings out, he brings out this wonderful truth, and he says, look, the, the truth is, is that is the nature of your bondage is sin. And they're still having trouble with that because they don't see themselves in, in that light. Remember, the Lord is talking to those that, that, that believe that they're believers anyway, and he calls them that. So there's a little bit of controversy of some of the uh, different people I looked at in my study. In 8.31 it says, And then Jesus said unto those which believe on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. He put a little, a little bit of a deal on there. But some commentators believe that well, who he's talking to here were professors and not possessors. You know what I mean by that? We use that term sometimes. There are those, there's a lot of people that walk around claiming to be Christians. They're claiming to be uh, they, they, they claim that they are, but they truly have never really come to a point in their life that they have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. To that day, that date and time when they really came to know Jesus Christ and received Him and became a true child of God at that moment through the born-again experience that takes place at that moment. That's what we're talking about. Now, that can be argued different ways. I'm just saying, putting that out there. Pastor Lapino, in his message last week, talked a little bit about sanctification. There's three different stages of sanctification, and that helps us to understand the Word of God because there's a lot of confusion there a lot of times. We call what the, well, first, this is what we call positional sanctification. I'm just using some terms that you get from your studies, but it's a positional sanctification. Positional sanctification is simply this. The very moment I was saved, I was positionally changed from one state to another state. I became a child of God, didn't I? 
And I, from that moment on, I can never, ever lose my salvation. Can I? Can I ever lose my salvation? No, I'm not. Once I say, why? Because it's a gift of God, isn't it? It's based upon his full, complete, and finished work, not mine. And nothing I can ever do to earn that. So that's done. The next one is what we call experiential sanctification. That's the one where, where, where we walk out, the walk in our life. What we, how we choose to walk. And this one can actually be, we might say, one is more separated than another. Or one is more sanctified than the other. You know, basically sanctification means to be set apart, doesn't it? But what that means is in our Christian walk, are we walking in the ways of the world still? Or are we walking in the Lord? Are we seeking to walk in the Spirit? That's what we're talking about there. And of course, the, the last is called the ultimate or we might say future sanctification, sanctification, which has to do with our glorification when we go to be truly with our, in our new resurrected bodies with the Lord. One cannot, one, as we just saw about, cannot ever lose their salvation, but we all are sinners. And the difference is that one chooses to live in sin while the other, rather the other, seeks to be delivered from sin. When we come to that moment of recognizing our life that we are lost and without hope and that we need to be saved, when we come to the Lord true, truly humbled and recognize that only in Him, only in Him can we be saved, and we come humbly and we ask Him to save us, He will, won't He? And it's not based upon how I feel, it's based upon His truth, isn't it? Taking God at His word. In John 8, 34, we read in 34 through 36, Jesus says this. I just want to add this one little thing. We talk about a slave. Let us remember what a slave is. A slave literally is one that has absolutely no rights. He has no status. He has no say in his own fate. In his own fate, whatever's going to happen to him. Such are those who are truly slaves to, slaves to sin, even though they may think that they're not. In John 8, 34, Jesus answered them, and he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. So if you're a child of God, sin and death have literally no power over you, do they? We know that Jesus Christ conquered that completely upon Calvary, didn't he? And through his resurrection. Romans 8, 1 reminds us that there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death. My friends, if you're here as a child of God this morning, you've been delivered. Sin and death truly have no power in your life. Now, we should think about that, as we've talked about a little bit in some of our studies thus far, how we should boldly walk in the light as well. As opposition is out there, and we're going to look at some of these things possibly this morning a little bit deeper. But in contrast to the slavery that, 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 that they, uh, the Lord has mentioned concerning the way that they were believing at that point in time, Jesus offers up his true sonship. Jesus can, can, can and does break the very feathers of sin in one's life. If you're here as a child of God, you are redeemed. But he now speaks of their blindness. They claim to be Abraham's seed. And the Lord, we know, partially accepts that because it's true. If you read Jeremiah, like I think it's 31, 9, he called where, uh, it's, that's one of the few places in the Old Testament where you see the word father in re reference to, the, to, the, to God, where he calls him the father of Israel. So yes, in that truth, the sense he is. And so we see what, did you, what our Lord says here when he, uh, in verse 37, when he says, I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me. Because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen of my father. And ye do that which ye have seen of your father. Wow. As far as their physical descent was concerned, it was so. 
But you know, in a sense, this made them a lot more culpable too, didn't it? They were a lot more responsible because to them were given all the articles of faith. To them, they had had all of this history and all of this opportunity. But he goes on to say, because they sought to kill him, and he brings out the point that Abraham was the friend of God. Abraham was the friend of God. In James 2, 23, we read, and the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Remember what we think of Abraham. When I say the word Abraham, and I think of him in the Old Testament, what do I think of? I simply think of this. He believed God. He believed God. That's what we see in the, in the New Testament. You know, the thing that makes Abraham who he is and, the, and the, the great man that we look at him and as Israel looks back on him is what? What is, it, what is it that brings him to that place in Jewish history? It's because he believed God, wasn't it? He believed God, and that's the point here. You know, about a quarter of the book of Genesis is devoted to the story of Abraham. Although Abraham was born and raised in a pagan and idolatry, uh, in, in pagan idolatry. But when God's word came to him, what happened? He obeyed. Exactly. He obeyed, didn't he? He obeyed. She doesn't read my notes. She just knows what to say. Okay. Uh, but anyway, he, huh? <laughs> That's right. He remembered. So we see this, that, that he obeyed. And he turned his back on all of his old ways and became a pilgrim and a stranger on earth. He, leaned, he, he, he learned to trust and obey God. His spiritual per, uh, pilgrimage actually begins with a, with a really great demand on his faith. He had to give up his father and the ways of his father. And the climax we might say it was even, was even when a greater demand came upon his faith when he was asked to give up his own son. Yes, Abraham. This is who they say that they're the father, uh, that, that is their father. You see, they're, they're, they're not following the way of this father. Abraham staked everything on his dependence on God and relied on his word. Jesus was saying, I think in so many words, my words virtually have no place in you. Why do they not have any place in him? They, so, 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 so do not, so in a sense he says, my words have no place in you, so, so do not boast that you are Abraham's heirs. Abraham is not your father. No, indeed, your father is who? The devil. He's going to say that plainly here in a few minutes. Yeah, we're gonna, that's one of our primary focus here this morning is on this at relationship here. Now look in verse 39, if you would, please. We're going to read 39 through 42. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said unto them, if, a, if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, We be born of fornication. I mean, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. And Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. You see, Christ, once again, is offering to give them deliverance, isn't he? He's showing them the light if they would just open their eyes, if they could just open up. But they're blinded by their own, with their own selves. We talked a little bit before about how people that want to be deceived are deceived, and we can see it in all of the world. We see it all of the time. No matter how much proof you show on one side and can prove a certain point, they will not accept it. They're going to rationalize and make up their own truth, and they're going to hold to that truth no matter what. And that's where we're at here. But Jesus is making an opportunity here. 
Christ offers to deliver them from this sin and from this bondage if they will simply open their eyes and listen. He is the light of the world. He shows them that they are not the true children of Abraham. Now they abandon that claim and make an even greater one. They move from Abraham. They say, you know something? We are, we're the children, we are the children of the Father. Father, our Father is God. Our Father is God. You see, he goes on in verse 42 to say, this, this, this proves that God is not, not their father, because if he were their father, they would have received him. You know something, my friends? There's a, there's a window in everyone's life that when we're, that Lord, as we talk, if we go and we look in, in, in Romans 1, I'm not, I didn't put that into most and also just kind of in a general sense, we know that we have an we we have a um, an innate knowledge of God, don't we? The Bible teaches we have an innate knowledge of God. And I've used many times, and if y'all been in class, I don't mean to bore you to everything, but think about a bird, that little bit of bird brain. He knows who his enemies are. He knows how to fly. He knows he knows what to eat and what not to eat. There's an innate knowledge in there. I used to think they went to bird school. You know, maybe they got a big, big school they all go to and they learn these things up front. They learn them, don't they? Mom gives them a little bit, dad gives them a little bit, but most of it is learned. They have an innate knowledge, don't they? God has given man an innate knowledge of himself. And then he tells us to look about us. And we can see in that. We can literally see by looking about. In the very world itself, cries out to us about the creation, the beautiful balance of how everything is together and the beautiful things and the inner workings of all things. And the more we learn, the more our faith should be strengthened. We learn about the cell and we learn about all of the things and how all of these things are in and of themselves energy and they're all moving and making and they all come together in a certain way and they all make things and do things. And we sit here this morning and I speak and you hear me and you understand what I say. And we can see things. I can see the pastor raising his hand over there. So, I mean, I can see all these things. Yes, sir, Mr. Pastor. That's, that's right. That's exactly right. And because, because, the word, because God is so far beyond anything that we can even imagine, isn't he? All that, all that the Lord has, so we can understand that. All of this proves that God is not their father because they were not, because, they, because if they were, they would have received him. They would have known him. Verse 43 now we see, and he's, this is Jesus speaking still, and he says, why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Are ye of your father, the devil? And the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he spake, speaks a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you conceiveth me in, in sin, or convinceth me of sin? And if I say, and if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is that he that is God heareth my words. And he therefore heareth them not, because ye are not of God. Now, my friends, and I don't think I'm speaking to the choir here this morning, but it's something we need to talk about just a little bit. Satan's real, isn't he? Satan is real. And, you know, Satan doesn't get talked a whole lot about. We like to talk about the better things. But the truth of the matter is, he's the prince and the power of the air. And there's a great power with Satan in the world and has been since the fall of Adam and Eve. And that power is there. But the Lord has promised that we're overcomers through Jesus Christ. And we need to keep this focus in our studies and in our walk and in the things that we face on a daily basis because it can overwhelm us. You know, the problem is we take our eyes off the Lord and we put them on ourselves. You know, when that happens, what happens? We see a lot of inadequacy. We can say, I can't do this. I know I can't do it. Well, of course you can't do this. You can't do this. Where do you do it? You trust the Lord. Just take one step at a time. 
whatever he shows you, go that one step and then take the next one. With the Lord, it's one step at a time, taking him at his word, going along, just like Abraham did. When, he had the Lord, when the Lord sent him out, he was going to a country, he didn't even know where he was going. And he took his family with him, trusting God. And he took it just one step at a time. We can look at all these different people, Moses, we can look at so many of them and see how they did these, these things, how important they are. Satan is real, though. We need to understand he is a spiritual being. He was of the order of the cherubims, and he was the highest of all of the angels. We see that like in Ezekiel 28, uh, verse 12. We can see a couple of those, or 14, and in Ephesians 6, 11. We'll look a little bit more in that minute. But what we want to realize is Satan, what was Satan's great thing? Think about the word. He said, I will. I will. That was it. Think about it for a moment. I will. Isaiah 14, 13 marks the introduction of sin in the universe, as one commentator put it. And I saw it in about two or three other places as well. In Isaiah 14, 12, it says, the Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sight of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. I will, I will, I will, right? Think about that for a moment. Schofield talks about this passage, and he says this. He says, of course, this is about Satan, who is the prince, the, and, and the, uh, the prince of the world system as we know it, and is, the re and, and is real in the unseen rulings and the successes of, of the world powers. What we need to recognize, and we're going to look at this as we get more in our study of John, but there is a true spiritual world out there, isn't it? It's probably more real than the physical world that we actually live in. And in that spiritual realm, there's warfares going on. And we get glimpses of it as we see in the Word of God in the Old Testament and things when some of the issues like with Tyre, some of the things when it talks about it, talks about when Michael came down and the different things that we see. We're not going to go all there this morning just for the sake of time because we'll get there eventually. But it's important. But what I did want you to see is that he is also the day star. And it's none other than Satan. And this tremendous passage marks the beginning of sin in the universe, which is the big, big point here when Lucifer said, I will. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. When we go to 1 John, if we look in 1 John in verse 2 and verse 15, and through John 17, we read these words. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust of the flesh thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. What do we see here? I will. I will. It's about man. And what we're seeing today, recognize that God is trying to be pushed out, which has always been the case with Satan. Government wants to replace that. They don't want you to have in your life, we should have God first, the Lord, right? Should the first, our first priorities are to the Lord, first responsibility to the Lord. Then it should probably be to our family. Then it should be to our government, right? There is responsibility as we go down. But you see, that is a threat to the world. That's a threat to the government. The government does not want the, the, the things of God in where they are or to be above where they are. They want to be above that. So therefore, there's, a, there's an attempt there to take that out. You were going to say something, sir. Well, the truth of the matter is he is the great deceiver. We're going to talk a little bit about that too. He is the great deceiver, and he is out to deceive us. And he does it by pretending to be God, doesn't he? Or by using truth, but only half truth. Those things are all true. But let us remember this. When the Lord says, love not love." Uh, let us not love the world. The world, remember, is temporary anyway, isn't it? Is not this world going to be judged? And we're all going to, at some point, we're all going to face death. It's easy. We all know it. 
but oftentimes we don't realize it for ourselves. We see it all around us, but we don't think about that so much for ourselves. That is, that we're not to love the world, out of the systems that are in the world, or, what the, or, the, or the way that it does it. There is a secular, an anti-God, or, ignorant, or ignorance of God's way of doing things that characterize human society. It's easy to love the world, in a sense. You know, if you love the world, there are rewards to be gained. You may find prestige or, or, or status or honor or comfort in, in, great, in, in, great, in great measure. One commentator said this is because the world system knows how to, revor- how to reward those that love it. But at the same time, even at their best, these rewards come from a world that, that lasts only as long as we live. And I don't know, I don't know anybody's in here. Anybody seen anybody 120 years old here recently? I know we're not going to make it that far. We might make it to 100 now. Some people are getting there, but not many. But you know what the same, but we all need to realize that the problem is that though one might gain prestige or, or, or status or honor and the comforts of this world, we may lose the, the prestigious stat- statues and honors and comforts of real heaven. So, we are to, the Word of God wants us to remember that as a child of God here this morning, we need to walk in the Spirit, and that's possible. In Galatians 5.16, for example, the Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall find, and ye shall not, and I'm sorry, let me start all over. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that ye, that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Remember, Satan is the great deceiver. He is the liar, and he is a murderer as well. Satan became the ruler of this world and the prince of power of the air, as we see in very in a number of... of uh, passages uh, in uh, John 12, uh, Corinthians 4, but we'll look at uh, Ephesians chapter 2 here for a moment this morning. When the Bible says in chapter 2, in verse 2, it says in, in Ephesians, when in times past ye walked according to the course of this world. Who's it talking about? When ye, who's the, who, who's the ye here? It's you and I, isn't it? It's you and I. Talking about before we were saved. He's saying, okay, Wherefore, in times past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. We were all under that influence. We were all in sin. And the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, in whom the God of this world have blinded their minds. Who's the God of this world he's talking about here? It's Satan, isn't it? It's Satan he's talking about. This is the God of this world. Have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. My friends, we are in a spiritual warfare, and it's quite real. He is the accuser. We see this in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, and it says, And that great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accuseth them before our God day and night. The word of God tells us what's going on. We can see a little bit of the spiritual warfare. We see what's going on behind the scenes. Very, very clear here. He's the tempter we see in Again, in Matthew 4, 3, and in, in 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, and of course, he's the deceiver. His very name means adversary or one who is opposed. Another of his titles, the devil, means slanderer. A slanderer. In 1 Peter 5, 8, the Bible warns us there, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Is that true? Are you seeing some of that? You think Christine's seeing some of that? There's a lot of challenges in this world, isn't there? There's a lot of challenges we all face on different levels in different ways in different times. 
But we can trust God above all else. We need to trust God. He walked about. He has, a, he, he, he has access, to, uh, access to everywhere. He knows your feelings. He knows your propitiation, your propitiation, for propensities. And he informs himself of all of your circumstances. Only God knows more and does more than he. Therefore, your, your care must be cast upon God. You can never stand against the devil. You can never stand in your own strength and think that you're strong enough to take on the devil. The way we win, the way we are, is through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We understand, we're going to look at this in a minute before we get to the end of this uh, this morning. We're going to see we need to put on the armor of God. The Bible tells us this. We need to remember that he is that roaring lion. Satan uses the term lion. I mean, the Bible tells us about a lion that may roar, but what, what happens when you become a Christian? He can roar and he can be scary and he can be everything else, but guess what? He's like a lion that's been defanged in a Christian's life. But many of us still fall for the trap. It reminds us of his deceptive lies. And he's still out to devour the souls of Christians. If he can't devour, if he can't, if he can't, get, you, uh, can't get you off the course, but if maybe he can't get you to, he might be able to just neutralize you. Just kind of freeze you up that you can't, you're not going out anymore. You're not, you're not, you're not seeking to be open, to, oh, where the doors are open, the Lord gives opportunities to, to witness to someone else or be an encouragement or stand up for what is right. Think about Abraham that we just read about in, in Genesis. He took a stand, didn't he? His family, all that he had learned, everything that he was, he was a pagan, that was the whole world that he was in. He took a stand outside of that, and his father wasn't very happy about where he went. He took a stand when he went out into the world with his, with his family and took them out and into a world that didn't know what was even out there and who the enemies and all the things that he may be facing out there. He took a stand because he believed God and trusted him no matter what came that God could deliver him or would deliver him in his way. My friends, we today are no different. We're in, we're in our own time. We're not in the time of Abraham, but we're in the day that we are today, and we need to be aware of these things. Satan is a style. He accuses the brethren. We can look in Job, and I want us to look at that just a moment this morning. This is one of the areas of the Bible I've always really appreciated. It really gives you an inside look a little bit at what really goes on in this spiritual realm. We see here in uh, Job chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God or not? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in, thy, in, thy, in, in the land. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath. And he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from his presence in the Lord. Now most of us know the story. This whole book of, of, um, of uh, Job is a wonderful book. But we see how the Bible talks about Job and what an upright man he was and how God had put a hedge of protection about him, how he was living in in, in, uh, in, in a wonderful faith in the Lord. He had a beautiful family. and had a lot of wealth. He had a lot of things. And without his knowing it, this took place in, 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 in the throne room of God between Satan and, and, and the Lord. And what happens? Well, God says, okay, go ahead. You can do anything you want to him. You just can't kill him. You can do anything you want. 
He destroys all that he has. He starts with his flocks and does all of that. Then he destroys his actual family, except for his wife. He takes it all. Then he and put, gives him a terrible plague of a terrible thing that was uh, just a, a disease that was so horrible. All of these things, and he doesn't know what's going on. And then his good friends come to him that are supposedly, and they have a lot of good words in many ways, but they're not, the, they're not from the Lord, and they can be a real uh, discomfort to him, challenging him in a very negative way. All of this, it gives us an insight as to what goes on in the spiritual realm and how we need to know that, as the pastor mentioned a little earlier, we don't always understand. We can't always put it together. But we know that we can trust God because there's purpose in it all. As we see at the end of the book of Job. We see at the book of the end of Job, the Lord restores all of that back to him. And you know something? He doubles it. And some people say, and he brought back his children, but he brought back basically the same ones, I mean, uh, 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 the same number. So now he had 14 children instead of seven. <laughs> He'd had seven in heaven already from when they were destroyed by Satan, and now he had seven more. So that was a double blessing too, wasn't it? So we see these things as the Lord does them. Yes, Satan is an angelic being who fell from the, his position in heaven due to sin and is now completely opposed to God, doing all in his power to fall God's purposes. And remember, he is the prince and the power of the air. Now I'm going to close with this because we're running out of time. But in Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 10, these are words and things we need to really take to heart. This is an area of Scripture we need to be very familiar with because we need to know that this is true. We need to take on and put on our whole armor of God. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Remember that. We look at all of the, oh, this person's doing this, this is doing that. Remember, there are powers beyond all of that that are working all of these things out. It goes on to say, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done to stand, done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that, utter, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therefore I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. We could spend a couple of Sundays on this, but I did want to give you that. That's an area of Scripture we all should be very familiar with and seek out. Bottom line, we need to put on the whole armor of God at all times. The enemy doesn't attack when you're ready. It's not like, okay, today at 3 o'clock he's going to attack, so I need to put my armor on by 2 o'clock, so I'll be ready when he comes in. That's not the way it works. He's going to attack when what? When you least expect it. Those enemies come in, they try to sneak in. The element of surprise, when you're least prepared, when you're at your weakest moment, that's when he's going to attack. Therefore, we must put on our armor every day and be prepared and that begins with the lord raising up ra raise, uh, raising up uh, 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 ourselves in, in in prayer to the lord and, and putting on these things but most of all the word of god seeking that seeking it out and, and start our day and all through it and using it throughout the day so we're going to stop there because uh, we're out of time anyway good, good place to stop so we'll stop right there pastor would you close us please pastor paul